Maria. Welcome to Porch Play Chats, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately named IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association. As part of our efforts to promote play, we're happy to introduce our Porch Play Chats. And these are conversations that focus on a wide range of topics from experts that are just as passionate about play as we are. You can find the latest Porch Play Chats and learn more about IPA USA by visiting our website at ipausa.org. Up in that top right-hand corner, you, there are links to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and our Instagram account. I'm Deb Lawrence, and I'm the president of IPA USA. And with me on the porch is Lisa Murphy. Hello. Hello, Lisa. Lisa's a board member, and you know her, as passionate about play as I am. And today joining us on the porch is Olivia Weisinger, who's a physical therapist and mother of four young boys. And Olivia is a play ambassador through her business, Rev Up Recess, which we, you know, already we love you, Olivia. <laughs> and in her home while pandemic schooling, homeschooling her boys in a pandemic with um, her boys, she's really come to the title of her session being um how how do we how can we how can we use this time of covid with all these restrictions to incorporate more play and how can we play safely during a pandemic so yeah. olivia welcome we're so glad to have you so glad to be here I love talking play and I love talking play with people that like play. It just makes it jovial, <laughs> it makes a fun conversation. Um, COVID has not been such a fun conversation. You know, it's been a little bit of a struggle for us to, to figure out the restrictions that we have and then to figure out how to, to live life in the midst of it. Um, and, but yeah, I, I, think we, I think we have to realize that play is vital and, and it's not one of those things that we can just drop off. It, you know, Stuart Brown says it's, um, it's as fundamental or basic as sleep. You know, our body needs play. And so we do need to come up with ways that we can play during this time and, and figure out how to do that safely with, it, with COVID. So yeah, that's where we are today. Do you so how have you how have you handled it both as a physical therapist but with your boys how have you made play a part of their day um and i'm not sure how old your boys are but i'm sure they're in virtual school right so how have you incorporated play throughout their day and what do you think is important for other families to hear about that yeah. So my, I have four boys and my oldest is seven. So my oldest is first grade. And so the other three had been in preschool prior to COVID. Um, and so we have, I mean, they're all together in ages. So they're seven, five, and I have four-year-old twins. Um, and so I, sometimes I feel like, like, I think I almost have like half of a preschool class. You do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm thinking if they're doing 12 kids, oh my gosh, they're, they're miracle workers. Um, but what we decided to do in our home was we decided not to go the virtual route through school. We decided to, to pull them out and homeschool them. And that just gave me the flex. I mean, when they're young like that, I, I find it very challenging to get the house quiet enough for them to talk on the computer and focus and those kind of things. And it, in our system or in our school system, it wasn't a situation where we were going to be able to have a lot of play time in their virtual program. And so I just said, well, play is more important to me. Um, and so we have kind of homeschooled and I call it pandemic schooling because I, we would never be home this much <laughs> in other scenarios. Um, but we have very much gone to, um, I don't even want to call it unschooling because I don't feel like I'm quite there yet, but we have a very laxed, um, very strong play-based approach in our home where our boys are playing all day long. And I'm, I'm learning from people like Julie Bogart and other homeschool moms that have talked a lot about free play and how to really capture wonder in their day. And so um, we have started doing things where I've started making each month kind of a theme to our curriculum. And so 
Um, we just uh, finished Christmas school. We're going into January. And so I'm doing um, like more of a health and garden school um, coming this spring for them. And so the idea is I, I set a theme or a play and I, I know kind of the elements of curriculum that I, I want them to learn. And then I'm just kind of setting it out there for them and say, letting them kind of pick it up. And then I kind of roll with them. And so I'm learning a lot more about um, following instead of leading. And that's, um, I, I've always read about that, but it's challenging to be the one to step back and actively be the follower. <laughs> you know. Um, so we, I've, I've loved learning in, in this seat <laughs> um, as more, more of a teacher role than I've ever been for young ones. So. Uh, and Olivia, I think what you just did is, is bring up something that is difficult for teachers to do. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for them not to lead mm -hmm. and so. to learn to follow. And so can you talk more about that? Yeah. What, how have, how is, how what you wanted to do has made, and you reflected on, ooh, that would be leading and not following. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so when I first started, I'll just kind of give you a historic view because I think it answers your question. Um, I started thinking, okay, I'm gonna, like I'm all science minded, right? So I'm like, I'm gonna be Charlotte Mason and I'm gonna, here's my curriculum and this is the, the things we're gonna do. And um, about three weeks in, my kids were like, we're not doing that. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, am I going to fight every day? How, you know, and I, and I knew better. I mean, I, I did play stuff before this, you know, but I was just more involved in, in the recess element of things, the playground element of things. And, um, and so I'm like, I know better than just fight for this. And so I started, um, I started, I went through a couple of weeks of kind of de-schooling where we just said, we're just going to take a break and I'm going to figure this out. Um, and what I started doing was observing them and just really watching them all day long. And we're quarantined, so we were watching each other all day long. And I started just saying, what do they like to do? What are they drawn to naturally? What are they getting up on their own, intrinsically motivated to go do? What will they spend hours doing without a fight? And then I just started putting things into that element. So um, I have one kid that loves to draw. And so I started just putting pencils and paper and, and, and different types of, um, I, I bought a whole craft cabinet basically. I just got all different craft supplies and every day I kind of have like my little morning basket if you will and I'll just put something on the table and I just watch what they do. And at first I thought they're not gonna learn anything. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm so wrong. And I, it's funny how you know that you read the literature, you know, they're learning, you know, play is learning. And yet you're the mom and responsible for the, when you're the teacher responsible for the education, you're suddenly like, are they going to learn anything? And now I see my kids, you know, they find anything and they want to know how to spell everything. And they're going around the house looking for words. And they're, you know, we found, um, my son found an old phone of ours that doesn't have service on it anymore. And he plugged it in. And he has been typing notes all day long. He's like, Jack is having fun. Jack is, you know, he's writing and he's, he's asking, how do I spell that? Where can I find this word? And it's, it's his, it's his joy. It's his learning. It's his motivation. Um, and I am seeing them do that in every subject. <laughs> so it's Olivia, that is the, the, just in that snippet, that scenario that you, that you described is, uh, is a whole workshop, right? On why we need to trust children mm -hmm. and you know Bev Boz always described curriculum as being the child and she would she would say you know throw out everything else the child is the curriculum and that's exactly what you've done you've recognized that as a good teacher you need to pick up on children's interests you need to follow what they're interested in you need to provide materials that mm -hmm. extend that interest and mm -hmm. magic happens and it's not magic it's because that's what play does right Absolutely. lisa oh you're muted i know i know <clears throat> it was really windy um <laughs> something that you very casually said olivia that i am going to steal and you was what are they waking up on their own to go and explore now our listeners and viewers who are in a child care center, of course, they're, they're, they're not going to know that. But I also know that we do cater to parents and people are still, um, I like how you said pandemic schooling as well, because if we really were homeschooling, we would never be at home. So I, I appreciate that as somebody who would have been a vigilante homeschooler, de-schooler, unschooler, if I actually had had children. But anyway, 
I love that notion of we took a break. I tried to do this because it's what I thought I was supposed to do. It wasn't working. Instead of beating myself up, we're going to put ourselves on pause and then I'm going to start paying attention because I also think that for um, for center-based programs, preschool programs who are looking to become more playful in their programming and in their curriculum, there's a lot of wisdom in what you very casually said. There's a lot of depth there. And, and I'm, I'm really wanting to kind of give you a nod for that because I'm, I'm, I wrote it down. I'm going to use that. We acknowledge this is what we did. Mm -hmm. It's not working. Pause. Let's start paying attention and go from there which sounds very simple um, and maybe over simple, like too simple for some people. But I, I think often we uh, make it harder than it needs to be. And Lisa, that is my whole philosophy for parenting, period, with play, with kids, period. It's so simple. I almost think I'm doing something wrong. Or like my, my second child had to do a bunch of speech therapy. And we went three times a week for a full year to the speech therapist. And we were worn out. We just needed a break. And I found a speech therapist that worked virtually online. And her idea was functional play, basically. And um, I started getting into that and using kind of the same observation, follow him, a lot of the same things we use in play. And his speech exploded. And I kept thinking, is his speech really improving? Because I'm not doing anything is what it felt like as a physical therapist who is used to treatment and, you know, a program and a curriculum and, and getting to this point where I just interacted with him and I just gave him clear speech in the time that we were playing and his speech exponentially blew up. Um, it, it works. It's so simple. And the hardest part is our mind believing this is all we need. <laughs> my, my favorite hashtag that I've started using a little bit more regularly is hashtag play is enough yes. play it, it, it's enough and i don't know where and i'm i don't want to take us off track but i don't know where or when or how or why we lost faith in what we knew and what we know um but i i think it's time for us and i i think never would i wish a pandemic on anybody but i really do believe that covid has allowed some of us to kind of reframe reconnect recalibrate and realize and re-remember, if I may say it like that, re-remember what we knew, that what we were doing was 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 enough. Yeah, yeah. We, we were in a play-based preschool before, and so I was already in love with, with play. I was already in love with all these things, and I knew these elements, but COVID has made us slow down even more, and I didn't realize how much more I could slow down and I didn't realize how much better it would be for us. It really has been good for the kids and good for us. And, um, and, and I, I tell my husband at the end of the day, I'm exhausted. And I'm like, I learned so many cool things today. I have a four-year-old that's throwing catapults and trying to get buckets of hay over, he calls it through the portal. He's like trying to get it through space. Like I see these kids do these most amazing things. I'm like, I didn't know he could do that. <laughs> and I didn't know he knew the word portal. <laughs> you know? you know? and, and so I really have enjoyed the slower pace of, of getting to just watch them and, and let them be the humans they are. And again, amazing lessons right there, right mm -hmm. there. Because if you just observe they you know Vygotsky tells us I don't know how familiar you are with Vygotsky's work but Lev Vygotsky told us that children not only learn from each from the teacher but they really learn a lot more from each other right and that when a child is actually playing they are functioning on a higher level mm -hmm than when you're trying to teach them something or they're in a more traditional setting. And so what you just described is exactly that. You didn't know he knew the word <laughs> portal. You didn't know he could do that because you gave them the space and time. And I think that's what Lisa and I and many play advocates are struggling with, with teachers who feel so pressured just like you were describing, it can't be this simple. I, I mean, I have to, I have to, I have to do this assessment. I have to, I have to teach them these things instead of just allowing that learning to unfold. Yeah, your assessment comes so naturally once you're observing, right? You start yeah. seeing 
wow, they can, you know, I, I think about that a lot as, as from a physical therapy standpoint, you know, I can, I can do these tests to do your motor skill and see how strong you are and t- do this test on your balance. But if I just watch the kid play, I can see his balance and what he chooses to do. Um, it, it's the same with, with education. I mean, they're showing me what he knows how to read and how he knows how to math. I mean, when he's motivated, he's showing me a lot better skill than when I'm testing him, right? Like when he needs to know exactly how much money he has in order to buy that toy he wants, suddenly he really knows how to add real fast. <laughs> you know? So there's a lot of assessment and observation. Well, and I think the other thing that, that you've highlighted is that the learning that they are doing is meaningful to them. Mm-hmm. It's relevant to their interests. Absolutely. It's in their daily experiences that you have created. So you've created the space mm-hmm. for them to be able to do this. And that is, I think, sometimes really hard for people to create the space. I always feel like you know, teachers say, oh, I have to be doing something. I said, you are doing something. You're not sitting at the table painting your nails. You're mm-hmm. observing, you're extending, you're scaffolding. Yeah, it's, you're working. Mm-hmm. And you do, you have to be mindful because every once in a while, they, they will do something that you, you have to give that little warning or that little, what do you think about that? What's your plan there? Where, where are you headed? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because they will suddenly build a towel full, you know, I, my kids learned to climb out the window recently. Oh, uh, so we were like, oh, we can climb out when we only have a single story home. So that's not so scary, but still, you know, um, so we started fire drills. <laughs> we just turned it into fire drill training. And, um, and then we talked about safety of when do we climb out of windows? When don't we, you know? And so, yeah, you, you're not, you're not painting your nails. <laughs> no, you are not. But I'm going to circle this back to, uh, and I guess Deb, and this is a little like on record, but off record, but do you release these in the order that we record them? No. Oh, okay. So then thank you. So one of the episodes that we have recorded, we talked with my Cuber about how sometimes all you need is one little gentle nudge, one little moving in close to one child. We're not gonna shut the windows. We're not gonna ban the windows. We're just gonna, we're gonna kind of morph this into something that becomes relevant for everybody. And and that's that's what I heard from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gentle reminders and permission and taking an interest and and channeling it, I would think, into an appropriate use. I, I remember we lived in a two-story house and my windows off my bedroom were right over the porch roof. <laughs> my yeah. mom did not know how many times. Yeah, that's the first thing I saw that I saw. I was like, well, they're four. So we now know how teen years are going. <laughs> We've already screwed it up. We're done. <laughs> I liked how I liked how you said, what, what's your plan with that? We uh-huh. used to actually, as a strategy, um, we found backstory, but we we found that we were shutting down some kids' investigations for a while. We didn't realize we were doing it. We were like, no, no, go go put that back where it goes. No, 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 no go put that. And we're like, wait a minute, pause. This is not what we're about. Let's start asking them, what's your plan? What's your plan? We one time saw a group of, you know, the group of children that you always want to move in on when you Mm -hmm. see that group together. Mm -hmm. We saw them go behind the shed with a toddler, a two by four, um, you said catapult and a, and a plank and I'm like, and a spool. And I'm thinking, I'm going to see a toddler, like the cow in the Monty Python movie going over. So we started pausing as the adults and saying, what's your plan? What's your plan? Because yeah. And, 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 and what I like to remind listeners, viewers, audience members, whatever, is that when you squat down as an adult and say, what's your plan, that is more important than actually fully executing the plan that might get stated to you, if I may be so bold. So squatting down and just sending the message that what that kid has to say is worthy of you listening to, I might not be able to say yes to the whole plan. You know, I remember Bev Boz, we, we often quote Bev, Deb and I here on, on the porch play chat, but Bev, Bev used to tell a story about a kid who was like, I need a, a watermelon, a head of lettuce, a cabbage, the microwave and a wheelbarrow. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> that wasn't really what it was, but it like, okay. You know, and 
what part yeah. of this can I actually yeah. say yes to? I'm not just having, gonna yeah. But you're also having them tell you, like they're having to think through it. Exactly. So if impulsive, you're giving them the time to pause and learn how to problem solve and think through it themselves. I might, my, my oldest sometimes I'll say, what's your plan? We've been doing this for, you know, since he was born and we've always said, what's your plan? That's been our, our, you know, and he'll say, you know, um, we're not going to do this after all. He just won't even tell me sometimes. So just be like, you know what? We're not doing it. Because he's already <laughs> had the opportunity yeah, like as he thinks process through it. We, we, we used to like to tell how the, the group of that we started saying, what's your plan for it actually got to the point where whenever this group of children saw adults walking towards them, they would amongst themselves be like, what's our plan? What's our, what's our plan? plan? What are we, what are we doing? What are we doing? But I love that you're so spot on Olivia in, in that, that recall. Does it actually make sense? Was it's allowing that? Well, talk about self-regulation, right? That pause is this really, is this me being, being impulsive? Did it sound fun in the moment, but I've given myself some time now to think like, mm, eh, I don't even, that's not my plan anymore, mom. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the beauty of not interfering, but asking a question, right? Sure. In, in an, a non-threatening way. It. What's your plan? And uh, I remember when I, when, I was a teacher and we were working on conflict resolution, you know, over and over and over again. I went through every step of conflict resolution 500,000 times a day. You know, what happened? How did it make you feel? What do you think you need to do? Is that a good choice or a bad choice? What else could you do? I'm here if you need Am me. I wrong? And over and that over and over again until the children started. Some adults, I, I, I occasionally would benefit from somebody saying, what's your plan? <laughs> I don't have one. I'm just moving. <laughs> right? what, what's, yes. what's your plan? <laughs> I've gotten to the point with like a conflict resolution. I mean, we have four little boys saying well, and the, 24-7. We, we, we are going through a lot of conflict resolution. And um, I feel like though sometimes they, mm -hmm. when I ask the question versus assume what I know, what I see, I love how some, they surprise me. I love how sometimes there's a lot more thought and a lot more plan and, and things I didn't recognize. Well, he said this and it hurt my feelings. And now I feel like, we, I mean, we've gotten to the point where we're just really expressing ourselves beautifully. I'm like, wow, I didn't see that, you know? And okay, I understand. Well, what other ways could you have handled that? You know, uh, conflict resolution is another big one that, that brings a lot of beauty to, to learning about each other, not, not just stopping a fight. Well, and, and I'm going to be a little stereotypical here, Olivia, and say, well, there's lots of men who don't know how to communicate those feelings. Mm -hmm. And so you are, you are helping them recognize the value. Be, and it's not because the men are horrible people. It's because they were shut down, right? When they weren't allowed to have feelings right. in many cases, yeah. or they were criticized for feeling a certain way. And so you're opening that avenue for them to recognize the value of communication and recognize the value of listening to each other mm -hmm. through that conflict. So again, amazing, you know, really, don't you want to be a teacher in an early childhood? Right. Can we hire you? I know. <laughs> because, you know, there are, there are gifted teachers out there who are in so intuitive and you are so intuitive, you know, you recognized and reflected, this is not working. Mm -hmm. I, I need to take a break and see what what's going on and why this isn't working. And I think so many times we feel like in order to be respected as teachers, that we have to be teaching it's a, lot of unlearning. it's a lot of unlearning. I can tell you, I, I have been hard at studying the literature, studying the research since Jack was born. He's seven now. And I really got into it because I thought, I don't know how to parent. I know how to do science. I know how to do therapy. And, and so play and, and re play research and child development and brain development became a lot of how I started developing my parenting. Um, and <laughs> I can tell you even now, I mean, it's seven years in and it's so hard to unlearn all those formative years of what a teacher should look like. Mm -hmm. 
even though I know better because it, it's my baby and there's so much to invest and so much at risk and so much at stake if I'm wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's what you, the mental struggle is as a parent or as a teacher, like I, I can't be wrong on this. The stakes are high <laughs> and then trying to back off and say, we can be wrong on some things, but, but then it brings me to telling my, my kid, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to mess up. When we learn better, we do better. Um, and just being real and, and, and that it's a struggle. It's a struggle to unlearn. Well, and I think that and recognizing that it's okay to say, I made a mistake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I shouldn't have said that. That was, you know, something I shouldn't have said, or I should have, I should have handled that better. It makes children I think respect you more because they recognize even adults can make mistakes Mm -hmm. so when I make a mistake I just need to talk about it and then I need to I need to be authentic in in my expression of being sorry about it instead of saying I'm sorry because I'm afraid I'm going to get in trouble right right Right. so which I I love how we talk so much about um and I'm sorry I am horrible with authors names I will remember it for the first like as I'm reading it and then if it's been six months since I read it I'm like that author that wrote this quote (laughs) um but they they talk a lot about not giving and not telling kids you need to say sorry Mm -hmm. right like don't don't come in and and mandate a sorry Mm -hmm. and so our line here is um you know that really hurt his feelings. You can, you know, he's saying it really hurt his feelings. I bet he would appreciate an apology if you were willing to give one or when you're ready, if you're thinking, you know, if you're sorry about this, when you're ready, would would you apologize? Um, I know, I know it makes you feel good when people apologize to you and, and just kind of giving that platform that um, a sorry is not mandatory right now, Mm -hmm. Um, but he hurts. Well, and I always tell, I always tell teachers when I'm doing professional development or teaching in the classroom, I always say when you when you force them to say sorry, you're teaching them to, it's okay to lie. Yes. Because they're not sorry. <laughs> they're well, not, and, in this and, moment, they're mad. And yeah. also, I don't think we're Go really ahead. good at uh, at unpacking what we mean by sorry. Like adults toss that. Go tell him you're sorry. That could be the first time that child has ever heard. That word, we're not putting any kind of clarifiers, any kind of understanding, any kind of, any any depth, any depth to that word for that child to understand and maybe then take the initiative the next time to actually instigate and be like, oh, I I did not mean to knock your block tower over. I am sorry, that really was an accident, which is very different than just, as you said, Deb, throwing out the sorry, even though I knew I knew that block that I threw across the room was going right to your head and I'm not sorry at all, but if I say sorry, I won't go sit in the timeout chair. Right. Yeah. But there's something so beautiful on the other end. Like when, <laughs> when you finally across the room, when you're not even part of the conversation, you authentically hear them apologize. Mm-hmm. When well, it's like, authentic. Yeah. You're like, oh, thank goodness. Yeah. Yes. I did something right yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Olivia, what I'm hearing is that you're doing a lot of things right. So (laughs) (laughs) we want to clone you and just, you know, put you everywhere. Um, But I'd like you to go back and talk about another struggle that you had, because I think we're learning lessons from you based on how you're resolving the struggles that you were having. So give us another example, if you have, if you have one on when you were placed in this position and you were like, oh my goodness. What was something, what was another struggle that you may have experienced? Well, we had a fight last night. Um, oh. The boys had gotten new little whiteboards and they were drawing. And um, we, our boys have been quarantined since March. And so their hair has gotten long. Mm-hmm. And so one, one boy was drawing the other boy. And next thing I know, whiteboards are flying. <laughs> and I said, we went over there. My husband and I were both, out, we were all outside. And we went over there and I said, what's going on? He drew me with girl hair. Oh. And I was like, Ugh. and the other boy's just weeping. Like he was not being ugly. He was just like drawing what he saw. Mm-hmm. And um, my husband said, well, and this isn't a great example of how we interact, but sometimes it's a great example. I don't know. Take what you want from it. <laughs> it might not fully answer you. Um, but my husband said, what, what is girl hair? you know, it looks like mommy's hair. And uh, I said, well, what's boy hair? My hair. And like, our hair doesn't look that different. (laughs) 
And so we're just like, what, what? And so um, my husband picked up a picture of Thor on his phone. Uh, my said, favorite person. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Said, <laughs> and so basically as we talked through it, my son's view was anything past the shoulders is mom hair, girl hair. And he, he drew that hair a little too long, you know? And I didn't even know my son had this, this feeling about hair. Like he loves his hair. He's cool. Um, and so my, my husband showed him a picture of Thor and, and said, how manly does he look? Does he look like a mom? Oh man. He, but that's because he's got this thing and he's got a cape. And he's like, well, do you want a cape? And he's like, no, like, and, and so then we just had a conversation about, you know what? Hair isn't man or female. It's, it's, it's not the hair. Like you're more than your hair, you know, more makes gender than hair. And so we just had this nice little conversation. And so sometimes it's not even about saying, sorry, it's about stopping where you're, where you're lost and where that miscommunication is and diving into what's causing this. What do you feel here? Um, and, and that's where we were there. Um, I guess you were asking for another apology letter. Well, which is another beautiful example, right? You didn't, you didn't say you shouldn't have thrown the whiteboard blah 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 you said what happened mm -hmm. and because look at the deeper message look at the 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 depth of what you just shared that would have been a, a missed opportunity if we if we chose to be overly focused on the throwing of the thing mm -hmm. as opposed to the intention behind the throwing of the thing and paying attention to that Right. Yeah, the, the, the communication of the behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Like at, at this point, they don't have deep communication. They, they have really small brain development wise. They don't have a lot of impulse control. Like, let's be honest. I'm so many months into quarantine. My impulse control is not the best. <laughs> and so I, I very much see their behavior as their communication. This is the best they have. I'm showing you I've had it, mm -hmm. you know. To that though, I want to say that their behavior is always their communication, yes. right? Always. always pandemic aside always yes always yes yeah. olivia this has been incredible just the little just the scenarios that you described have provided the viewers with some concrete strategies to use that are meaningful whether you're a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad or a teacher in a classroom just the just the just the little tidbits of information, the jewels, the gems that you shared are going to be valuable to our listeners. And that is extremely, we, Lisa and I are very appreciative of that. Uh, Lisa has notes. <laughs> Lisa took notes. <laughs> well, I'm glad because I love her. Oh, I love her. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, man. I appreciate you guys so much. It's so easy to feel kind of like this imposter syndrome when you're used to clinic work and you're used to, you know, and you know, brain development and you know, these things, but then you're kind of speaking in another area that it's not your formal learning, you know, like I'm not a teacher. And so sometimes I, I feel like, oh, you're actually a, a play therapist, yeah. um, which I was going to wait and share that with you after we were done recording, but I'll, I'll, I'll jump out there right now. You, you have the soul. Of a, of a of play, a play therapist. therapist yeah, yeah. absolutely an amazing play therapist <laughs> yes and so um i'm gonna close this up but don't go anywhere um okay. i'll be we'll be i'll be right back um to stop the recording and then we'll talk for a few more minutes but um to learn more about porch play chats make sure that you visit um ipausa.org and thanks for listening and keep on playing <laughs>